Good Sunday evening to you. We're glad you tuned back in tonight on Sunday night, and uh, we're just uh, still thankful and uh, for the time we had together this morning and looking forward to tonight. And uh, we just pray that the service will be a blessing to you. And so now let's listen to a song from our adult choir, and I hope this song will be a blessing. This is one of my favorite songs the choir sings, by the way, because uh, in the times that we live in right now, we need to be reminded that no matter what the circumstances, God is still good. So let's listen. Listen as the choir sings, God is still good. Amen. <laughs> I said before, that's one of my favorite songs that the choir sings. And uh, I tell you what, I'm glad God is still good, aren't you? He's good in the good times. He's good in the bad times because God never changes. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? Well, I'll tell you something. Uh, this has been so different for us as pastors during this time. It's different for you as well. And uh, many of you having to stay home uh, from jobs and so forth as well. And uh, a lot of changes in our lives. And uh, it's different for us being here. And that's one of the things I don't like about this is we can't be together. I miss the handshakes. I miss the hugs. I miss the uh, all the things that we do in the fellowship time. I just miss that. And uh, I, I sure hope uh, that you and I will not ever take it for granted. Amen. That we'll just be thankful for every time that we do get together uh, after this is over with. And uh, so I don't like that part of it. But I'll tell you one thing, one benefit 
of, uh, of all this with the coronavirus and all the limitations. One benefit has is it's, it's allowed us to be more flexible. We've had to be more flexible. You know, we preach to uh, empty pews. We preach uh, from pulpits. We preach at home. We preach in our living rooms. We can preach in our church office. We can preach basically anywhere, and I'm glad for that. And it allows us to be more flexible in our services as well. Uh, and uh, I tell you, I was, I was praying about what to do for tonight, and and uh, the uh, Lord has kind of been putting a, a certain message on my heart, um, not from me, but from a guest preacher we've had here before, Brother Brian McBride. And this message I hadn't even thought of in, in years, but just really has been on my heart, and I think it's something that, that will encourage you. And so we're going to play this message that Brother Brian McBride preached here in our January Jubilee. I think this is back in 2017, I think it was, but the message is so, is so applicable for today. So you listen as Brother Brian McBride preaches. The book of Job, chapter 2, please. I don't know if we're going to stay in the book of Job. I really did not intend to start in the book of Job, but the Lord directed us there this morning. I appreciate you being back in the service tonight. How many were in the service this morning? Amen. Amen. All right. I often tell people, if you come and hear me preach once, it might be by mistake. <laughs> but if you come back the second time, you have no one to blame but yourself. You <laughs> You knew what you were getting into, so I appreciate you being here. I was in a service in Jordan Baptist Church in Lynchburg, Virginia. I preached revival there for years and years. And on Sunday morning in Sunday school, the pastor got up and he said, this is the first day, the first service of revival. He said, how many have been here every service so far? <laughs> of course, that was everybody. So they raised their hand. He said, all right, you have a perfect record. Don't spoil it. <laughs> so you have a perfect record so far, so I hope you'll keep on and come and be here in the rest of the services. Thank you for the good singing. Enjoyed the congregationals. I enjoyed the choir number, and I enjoyed our brother special. Amen. And uh, it's been a blessing already to be here. And then, uh, again, thank you for the nice place to stay, and I enjoyed some good fellowship with the preacher and his wife today, and some folks bought our meal. I guess we looked like we were doing poorly. I don't know. <laughs> But, uh, you know, when you're evangelist, you have to learn all these tricks. You watch people you know come by the table. You bow your head and say, oh, God, send somebody by to pay this bill. <laughs> now, you're laughing, but it's worked a couple of times. <laughs> Amen. Job, the second chapter. And we'll start reading in verse number one. Job chapter two and verse number one. Uh, there's certainly a lot of things in chapter one that we will not get to, but I want to zero in on really a word tonight in the second chapter of the book of Job. The Bible said again. Now that's an interesting word, isn't it? The devil's not going to attack you once and leave it at that. Again. So just be prepared. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? And still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. But put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand but save his life. So went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. And he took him a potsherd to scrape himself with all, and he sat down among the ashes. I think we'll pray a moment. And then I want to preach on this subject tonight. What are you scraping with? Father, we love you tonight. We thank you for loving us. We thank you, Lord, for helping us this morning in the service, speaking to our hearts, and you've been so good to us again today. 
And you're a precious Lord and a sweet God and a wonderful Savior that I love you tonight. I pray you'd help me love you more. And then, Lord, I pray you help your people tonight from the preaching of the Word of God. And if there be one here lost without God and without hope in this world, may they get their name written down tonight by repenting of their sin and receiving the Lord Jesus as their Savior. Help us now. Help this preacher get glory unto yourself. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now here we have Job in this second chapter and the Lord has allowed the devil to put his hands on Job as it were. And the Bible said that he has smitten him with sore boils from his foot, the sole of his foot unto his crown. I take that to mean that from that on every portion, every part of Job's body, there is pain. I was trying to read what some medical doctors said about this passage, and I'm not very medical in my thinking. I, I, I think I flunked biology. I'm not sure. Uh, I don't remember that far back. But, uh, but uh, they tried, I tried to read what they said, and everybody had an opinion, and everybody had an idea, but at the end of the day, everybody was agreed on one thing. Job is in bad condition. He is hurting all over his body. And now the Bible said he has gone out and he's sat down in the ashes. Sat down among the ashes. I've tried to read a little bit about this ash heap that he's in. And there are a couple different explanations and ideas. Some say that these are the ashes of the sacrifice, the offering that Job made in chapter 1. And that could very well be. I'm not saying that that's wrong. I do not know. But I noticed this. The Bible said he took him a potsherd. Now, a potsherd is a broken piece of pottery. It's what's left over after you're done with something. This is not part of the message, but it's a thought you might want to consider sometime that a broken man is finding uh, comfort in a broken thing. And so here is Job sitting down in this ash heap. And what makes me think perhaps that this ash heap is a refuge pile is because Job finds this potsherd, this broken piece of potsherd. Now, later in the book, he'll say this. He'll say, my skin is broken and become loathsome. And so what Job is doing is he sits down in the ashes, he finds this piece of pot shirt and he begins to scrape himself. There's putrefaction, there's infection, there's all sorts of things all over his body. So he takes that pot shirt and he begins to scrape. He doesn't have the things that we would have today to help with the pain and to help with the discomfort. And so what he's trying to do is he's trying to find something that'll give him comfort in the midst of his trouble. And what he's come up with is a broken piece of potsherd. A potsherd. Now I begin to think about Job scraping himself with the potsherd. He's reaching for comfort, trying to find some help in his distress. And the thought struck me, what do you reach for when you're in trouble? When you're hurting when you're in pain, when you've been let down, when you've been deceived, when you've been disappointed, whether it's emotional or physical, whatever the discomfort is, I'd like to ask myself, and I'd like you to ask yourself tonight, what do I reach for to try and find comfort? I remember reading some years ago, I read about a, a little book, a fella, he was kind of a psychologist and I'm not too much into this psychology business. The Bible will give you every answer that you need to every question of life. But he said this, he wrote a little book, he called it Love Hunger. And the premise of the book was sometimes we have trouble with our weight because when we're distressed, when we're in discomfort, we reach for food to try and comfort us. He called it love comfort. I'm wondering tonight where you get your comfort from, where you find comfort. Now, in thinking about that, I noticed this word potsherd and I began to study it in my Bible. And here's what I discovered. The word potsherd is only found four times in our Bible. And it's very interesting where it's found and how it's used. The one time that it's mentioned is here in our text, the potsherd that Job is finding comfort in. 
But I want you to notice with me tonight the other three times that this verse is used. I want you to go with me first of all to the book of Proverbs, if you will, and the 26th chapter. Proverbs and the 26th chapter. In the book of Proverbs, chapter 26, this entire chapter, the context of it is lessons and instructions about a fool. Notice the beginning of it, Proverbs 26. As snow in summer and as rain in harvest, so honor is not seemly for a fool. Verse three, a whip for the horse, a bridle for the ass, and a rod for the fool's back. Verse four, answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto him. If we would keep reading, we would keep reading about the fool. Verse 11, as a dog returneth to his vomit, so a fool return, uh, returneth to his folly. On and on we go. But when we get toward the end of the chapter, look with me in verse 22, if you will, please. Proverbs 26, 22. The words of a tail bearer are wounds, and they go down into the innermost parts of the bed. Belly. Burning lips and a wicked heart are like a potsherd covered with silver dross. He that hateth the semblance with his lips and layeth up deceit within him. When he speaketh fair, believe him not, for there are seven abominations in his heart. Now, when we come to Proverbs 26, the context is the fool. But when we get a little closer here toward the end of the chapter where the dross is found and the potsherd, the immediate verses surrounding it have to do with lying. They have to do with covering up. They have to do with deceitful words, saying things you don't mean, speaking words with abomination in your heart. So the picture here, a potsherd covered with silver dross. Now let me ask you a question. Why would you take the time to cover a potsherd with silver dross? What's the point? What good is silver dross on a potsherd? Well, what you're doing here, what the writer is referring to is someone has a piece of potsherd and he's trying to make it look like something that it's not. He's trying to pass it off for something better than it is. So he covers it up with the dross, the leftover from the refining of the silver. And so when he shows it to you, it will look like something that it's not. It is a deception. It is, can I call it this tonight? It is a cover-up. So I'm wondering tonight, how many times when we suffer do we reach for a cover-up and a deception to try and find comfort in the midst of our trouble? Now here's what I'm talking about. The Bible tells us in the New Testament about, uh, about sowing and reaping. Galatians, the Bible said, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. If he sow to the flesh, he shall of his flesh reap corruption. If he sow to the spirit, he shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. In the Old Testament, the Bible said, be sure your sin will find you out. And here's what I'm thinking now tonight. Now, follow me a moment. Not all sin or not all suffering is the result of sin immediately. All suffering is the result of sin because of what happened in the garden, but all of my suffering is not the result of my own personal sin. Sometimes it's somebody else's, but some of my suffering is the result of my own personal sin. It is reaping what I have sown. That's why Paul tells us when he's dealing with the church at Corinth, he said they were misusing the Lord's Supper. In other words, they weren't taking it seriously. It was a joke to them. Uh, there, there was no contemplation in it. They didn't search their hearts like they were exhorted to. And so Paul said to this to them, for this cause some are sick, some are weak, and some have fallen asleep. You know what'll happen when we have sorrow and we have trouble? Sometimes we know the cause of it. We know that we are the cause of it. We know we've not been walking with God. We know that it's chastisement. But what we do is we cover up our sin rather than dealing with it. I like to call it hiding behind Job. Because Job's suffering here does not seem to be the result of his own sin. 
Sometimes people say, well, pray for me. I'm going through a difficult time. I'm, I'm, I'm in trouble and I'm, I'm having difficulty and they would like your prayer and they would like your sympathy, but the problem is they know why they're in the trouble. They know why they have the sorrow. They know why it's come. It's because of sin, unconfessed and unforsaken. Sin, mark it down, friend. Sin always brings sorrow. So I said, well, I get away with my sin. If you do, you'll be the first one that ever did. No one else ever has. Be sure your sin will find you out. The soul that sinneth it shall die. Some, some reach for a cover up and they will not deny. They'll blame it on everybody else, blame it on everything, blame it on this, blame it on that. When the truth is the problem lies here, the problem lies in the heart. The Bible said, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth every son. If you belong to God, somebody said, can a Christian sin? He can, he just can't get away with it. God won't let him get away with it. And if you can get away with sin, then there's a question whether you've ever been born again, whether you've ever belonged to God, because God chastens his children. Sometime our physical trouble, our emotional trouble is the result of our own sin. And so we reach for a cover up to try and comfort ourselves rather than repenting. I was preaching in the state of Michigan and I preached a little while and I don't remember, I, I was preaching out of, of Genesis on Jacob, preaching about Jacob being crippled by God. And I preached the message and when we got done, we started the invitation. I was standing in the pulpit. The pastor was seated behind me on the platform and I saw him out of the corner of my eye, I saw him get up. And as we proceeded with the invitation, I saw him walk down sort of hurriedly and determinedly toward down the side aisle. And I, I glanced over to see where he was headed and there, were, there was a couple, an elderly couple coming down the side aisle. She was in a walker. She was crippled over. She could barely walk. Her husband was helping her down the aisle. When they got about halfway, the pastor met them and they said some words. We're, we're still continuing now with the invitation. They spoke some words. I saw them shake hands. And then the pastor turned and led them down the side aisle and they came down to the front and they stood, the lady sat down, the man and the preacher stood. I did not know those folks. I didn't know what was going. I didn't even know the preacher that well. When the service was over, the pastor got, uh, he stood beside that man and he said to the congregation, he said, now y'all know, and he named their names. And he said, they've come this morning because they want to get right with the church. Now I did not know what had happened, but years before, that couple had started a rebellion in the house of God. They got angry and bitter over some things that had happened that they did not agree with. And they tried to sow discord among the brethren. And they had left. And all of those years they had gone on. All of those years, whenever it was brought up, it was a point of contention. It was a point of sorrow and a point of trouble. And always when it was brought up, always it was, well, that pastor or that church member or that so-and-so. But that morning, God had pointed his finger in their heart. And they had come to tell the priest they were wrong, that they had been wrong and they wanted to get their hearts right and I'm telling you, a sweet spirit moved in over that church and the preacher told me later over that family. Why? Because they found comfort not in covering up but in telling the truth. If you tell God the truth, if you own up, God will help you. You can find comfort but not in the potsherd of cover up. I want you to notice another time it's used. It's found in the book of Isaiah and the 45th chapter. Isaiah chapter 45. Here in Isaiah 45, let me read a few verses to you. We'll start uh, down here in verse five. In Isaiah 45, I am the Lord and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is none else. I form the light and create darkness. We're in Isaiah 45 and verse seven. I make peace and create evil. 
I, the Lord, do all these things. Drop down ye heavens from above and let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open and let them bring forth salvation and let righteousness spring up together. I, the Lord, have created it. Now watch verse nine. Woe unto him that striveth with his maker. Let the potsherd strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say to him that fashioneth it, what makest thou? Or thy work he hath no hands? Now listen to what he's saying. God just gets done finishing. He's telling Israel, I'm the Lord. There's none else beside me. Nobody else is like I am. Nobody else can do what I do. Nobody else has done what I've done. And yet, I made you and you're contending with me. You're striving with me. You're arguing with me. Here is the second place people try to find comfort when they're suffering, and that is contending with God. Say, now, Lord, I don't deserve this. Lord, I shouldn't have to go through this. Lord, all I've done is try and serve you. All I've done is try and be what you'd have me to be. And I shouldn't have to be faced with this and I shouldn't have to go through this trouble and I shouldn't have to go through this trial and somehow contending with God over whether he's right or he's wrong. Can I settle that argument this evening? He's right. He's right. He's always right. He's never wrong. He's never been wrong. He will never be wrong. He's always right. I often think of Jacob in the Old Testament. Jacob has suffered the loss of his son, Joseph. And now the boys have come back from Egypt and they've met Joseph. They don't know it's him. You remember now? And Joseph has said to them, don't you come back here. He said, you spies. Don't you come back unless you bring your little brother. So they go home and they say to Jacob, the Lord of that country spake roughly unto us and he took us for spies and he told us not to come back unless we bring Benjamin. So you know what Jacob said? And he's kept, by the way, he's kept Simeon in jail. So Jacob looked at him and he said, Joseph is not and Simeon is not and you will take Benjamin away. And then he makes this statement, all these things are against me. You know what? Not one of those things was against him. All those things were for him. Not one against. Joseph is preparing a way for them. Simeon will be reunited with them. Benjamin will be reunited with his brother. All those things are for him. But you and I somehow get the idea like Jacob that we know better than God. Now here's what happens. James said this. He said from, now hang on because this sermon may get better before it's done. Okay, so stay with me. James said this. He said, from whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts, which war in your members. So James said, there's fighting going on out here. Where's it coming from? So it's coming from here. And what he's saying is, then he goes on and says, you have not because you ask not. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. So what he's telling us is this war that's out here comes from war that's in here. Contending with God. When you argue with God and fuss with God, you have thrown him off the throne and sat down in his place. You have somehow said to him, I know more than you know about me and you don't care about me and you don't want what's best for me. When we know in the Bible, God said, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, thoughts of peace to bring you to an expected end. Someone will say, well, you don't care about me. It's the same, it's the same accusation that Absalom used against David. You remember when he's trying to steal the kingdom and he stood down there in the gate and he waited, I think it's 2 Samuel 15 and the children of Israel are coming 
through. And he said whenever he saw an Israelite, he'd say, he'd say, hey, let me talk to you. And then he'd say this. He'd listen to him, what his problems were. And he'd say, well, he'd say, uh, the king doesn't care about what's going on. He said he hadn't sent anybody over you uh, to watch your matters. He said, oh, that I uh, could be set over such a thing. And what he was saying was, God, uh, David doesn't care about you. The king doesn't know what you're going through. If I were king, I would take care of you. That's exactly what your flesh and the devil will say to you. God doesn't care. God doesn't know. But I want to remind you what the Hebrew writer said. He said, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was at all points tempted like as we are and yet without sin. And he went on to say this. It behooved him to be made like unto his brethren that he might be a faithful and a merciful high priest. Does God know what I'm going through? He does. Does he want what's best for me? He does. For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. That word touched in Hebrews 4, touched with the feelings of our infirmities. I was reading a fella and he was speaking about that verse and here's how he explained it. I've never tried this, but this is what he, how he explained that verse and that word touched. He said, if you took two harps and you put them in a room and he said, if those harp strings are in perfect tune with one another, he said, then when you pluck the string on this harp, the string on this harp will vibrate in response to that string. He said, that's what that word touched means. That God's heart is so in tune with my heart and your heart that when our heart strings are plucked, his heart strings are plucked. He is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. It's best not to contend with him. Now there's one more potsherd. Got time for one more? The book of Psalms, the 22nd Psalm is the third potsherd that we will find in our Bible. This is my favorite one. Psalm 22. Listen to how it begins. Psalm 22 in verse one. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You remember those words? We're gonna read them again, aren't we? Later on, we're going to read them in Matthew 27. Those are the only words from the cross that Matthew reminds us or records. But there's one of the seven sayings of the cross. Why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Verse seven said, all they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head. Remember what Matthew and Mark and Luke and John said when they walked by the Lord as he hung on the cross, they wagged their heads at him. And then they said this, he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him seeing he delighted in him. Look in verse number 13. They gaped upon me with their mouths and as a ravening and a roaring lion, I am poured out like water. All my bones bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. He says in verse 17 and 18, I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Now, I've read these verses. I don't have time to read the whole chapter, but did any of that sound familiar to you? Uh, my my strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaveth to the roof of my mouth. I may tell all my bones. Any of that sound familiar? They wag their heads at me. They said he trusted in the Lord. Let the Lord deliver him if he delighteth in him. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Does any of that sound familiar? Why, this is Calvary, friend. We're reading in Psalm 22 a foretaste of Calvary, a prophecy of Calvary. Now here's what I want you to see. You can hide and try and find comfort and cover up. You can try and find comfort and contention. You won't find them there. But let me tell you where you can find some comfort, friend. If you'll run to the foot of the cross and get in the shadow of Calvary,
Calvary and see Jesus dying on the cross for your sin, you can find some comfort in the midst of your trouble. This is the potsherd that will, co that will comfort you. This is the potsherd that will help you. Take a trip to Calvary. That's all of our problem. That's always our problem. We get to wandering too far away from the cross. We get out from the shadow of Calvary. We lose it in our minds. We need that Calvary touch tonight. Now you say, preacher, why would Calvary, why would it comfort me in trouble? Well, First of all, because of the truth of the scriptures. Now, David is writing. David has never seen a crucifixion. Hadn't been invented yet. But he's writing exactly what will take place in a man's body when he's crucified. How does he do that? Because David will say in another place, my tongue is the pen of of a ready writer. He said, I'm not the author. I'm just the pencil. I'm just the pen that the author picked up and put down. You say, preacher, what are you talking about? I'm talking about inspiration. I'm talking about holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. I'm talking about the fact that my Bible is not what men wrote down about God, but is what God wanted me to know about himself. I'm reminded tonight that my Bible is the inspired, infallible, inerrant, preserved word of God. So when I read hundreds of years before it ever took place, I read David describing what takes place in a man's life on Calvary. I'm reminded that whenever I'm in trouble, whenever I need comfort, I have a Bible that's true. There are no mistakes in it. It's always right. It's always been right. I'm thankful for the word of God. You say, preacher, well, I'm in a mess and I don't know what to do. Get your Bible out. You say, preacher, I feel far away from God and I don't know what to do. Get your Bible out. You say, preacher, I got decisions to make and I don't know how to make them. Get your Bible out. Preacher, I'm, in, I'm sick and I don't know how to deal with it. Get your Bible out. You say, preacher, I've got family trouble. I don't know what to do. Get your Bible out. Every question is answered here in the inspired word of God. Most of the time we are comfortless because we don't know what our Bible says. Dr. David Gibbs was in a trial and a man was on trial because of some things he had done for the Lord that those in his area deemed to be illegal. He'd been serving the Lord and they were persecuting him. And so they put him on trial and the prosecuting attorney said to him, now sir, you say that you have done what you've done because you believe the Bible. He said, I do. He said, you've told this court that you live according to the Bible. He said, yes, sir. He said, then let me ask you, sir. Have you ever read the Bible through from cover to cover? And the man dropped his head in shame because he never had. So you can't find comfort with Dr. Phil. You can't find comfort with Oprah and Dr. Spock and all that. But there is a place you can find comfort. You can find it in the blessed word of God and in the pages of this Bible. Amen. Not only the truth of the scriptures, but when I look at this portrait, I'm reminded of the love of the Savior. Why did he go to Calvary? Because he loved me. Because he loved you. Oh, I know. I know we like to get we like to get up here. We like to get a little uppity. And we like to preach about God vindicating his holiness and God demonstrating his wisdom and God. But you know, the truth of the matter is Calvary was not just about holiness. It was not just about wisdom. It was all about love. The love of God shed abroad on the cross of Calvary. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have ever everlasting life. Calvary was about love. That's why Paul talked about that great love wherewith he loved us. I'm going to tell you, friend, you say, preacher, I, I don't know. I don't know what to do. I'm in the middle of a trial. Then go to Calvary and get a good look at Jesus dying on the cross and be reminded that he loved you enough to die in your place. You see, love does what's right. Love is not an emotion. Love is an action. Love does what's right. I remember, I'm just thinking about this. Quite a few years ago now, our oldest daughter, Rachel, had 
she had a little touch of scarlet fever. We were down in Florida. We were traveling. She's just little. And we had to take her. We didn't have a regular doctor. We traveled all the time. We had to take her to a walk-in clinic because we couldn't get her fever down. Now, you have to understand, we never let our girls just cry and scream because they didn't get their way. We never let them pout. If we found them pouting, we gave them something to pout about. <laughs> if one of them didn't get their way and they were quiet over in the corner, I'd say, are you pouting? They'd say, no, dad. <laughs> so we went in. I'm trying to remember if it was Rachel or Bethany. It was one of the two. I'm getting old. And uh, so we went into the place and they took some information and finally the nurse came out and she said, it was Bethany. She said, Bethany McBride. And my mother picked her up. I think she was two and a half. She might've been three, somewhere in there. And so they went in. I tried to go with them and the lady said, no, you can stay here, sir. So I sat down. I sat down out in the waiting room. Now here's what they did. They took Bethany in. They took her temperature. They did all the preliminary stuff that they that, that they had to do. And then, and then, uh, then they were, uh, they were trying to clean out an ear infection that had somehow gotten involved in this whole deal. And the nurse, the nurse was holding one leg and one arm and mama was holding the other leg and the other arm. And the doctor had this long thing that had like a little scoop on the end and he was digging some infection out of her ear. And she was screaming. I think more because she was scared than hurt. Daddy and mama have brought her into a place and daddy has abandoned her and mama's helping some nurse and some strange man hurt her. And she's screaming. You say, preacher, what were you doing? I wasn't in the chair anymore. I was pacing. I was pacing. I was walking up and down. And I tell you what I wanted to do. I tell you what I wanted to do. I wanted to walk in there and punch the doctor in the nose <laughs> and take her home. But I didn't. You know why? Because I knew what they were doing was going to help her. And I was willing to let her suffer so that she could be helped. And it wasn't because I didn't love her. And it wasn't because I couldn't help her. And it wasn't because I didn't know. And it wasn't because I didn't care. It's because I knew something she didn't know. I tell you what you ought to do when you're suffering. Grab you the pot shirt of Calvary. Yep. And say, I may not can understand what this is about. I may not can explain it, but I know this. God loves me. Yes, He's already proved it. And I think if I'm going to do any scraping, I'll just scrape with that pot shirt a while. I'll just scrape with that one. I'll just say, Jesus loves me. This I know. You know, that's the greatest song ever written, I think. Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. And you may not can understand it, but find some comfort in the fact that Jesus loves you. He has proved it. There's no doubt about it. He loves you. Find your comfort in that posture, the truth of the scriptures, the love of the Savior, and then finally the victory of God. Do you know what happens at the end of chapter 22? Look at it, verse 28, verse 27. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord, and all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee, for the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the governor among the nations. All they that be fat upon the earth shall eat and worship. All they that go down to the dust shall bow before him, and none can keep alive his own soul. A seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born, that he hath done this. Now think about what that writer is saying. Jesus, in the first part of this passage, he's hanging on a cross. They're wagging their heads at him. They're saying, uh, I'll let God deliver him. He said, God delighted in him. They're making fun of him. They've taken his life. He's suffering. But when we get to the end of the chapter, the Bible said there'll be a seed that shall serve him. He said all those uh, shall come and they shall declare his righteousness. He's saying, you know what's going to happen? This thing looks bad while he's on the cross, but it's headed for something better. And it may look like he's lost, but he's really winning. It may look like they've defeated him, but he's really going to be victorious. And you and I need to remember when the world looks at 
us and sometimes we look at ourselves and say I can't make it through this remember there is a God of power and authority who is on our side and working on our behalf you know Paul was writing in Romans 8 here's what he said he said for we have been made more than conquerors through him that loved us Lord Admiral Nelson was in the, with the English fleet fighting the French. A great battle took place. At the end of that battle, he lost his life. But before the battle was over, he sent a communique to England. He said this. He said, victory is not a large enough word to describe what has taken place here today. I would like to think of Paul writing and God telling him what to write down. And Paul writing and saying, we're conquerors. And the Lord say, no, 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 that's not big enough. That's not large enough. That's not good enough. They're not just conquerors, Paul. They've been made more than conquerors through him that loved us. Now I know one thing when I preach. Everywhere I preach, there's somebody with a broken heart. There's somebody suffering. There's somebody facing adversity. There's somebody in trouble. An old preacher friend of mine said one day from the pulpit, he said, whenever you preach, remember, there's a broken heart on every pew. So everybody here tonight, or maybe a good many of us, are trying to find some comfort somewhere. If you're trying to find comfort in denying that you're guilty, there'll be no comfort there. If you're trying to find comfort in arguing with God, there'll be no comfort. But here's the thing, friend. If you can just get on your knees at the foot of the cross and say, Lord, you love me. You always do what's right by me. You gave the best you had for me. You can find some comfort there. God can give you back your peace, give you back your joy. Some years ago, I was in Maryland preaching, and I stopped at an Ames department store. The reason I stopped was because I had a sign that said, going out of business, 75% off. And as I walked out toward the door, my wife was with me and my two girls. There was a, there was a box there. And it said on the outside of the box, they had filled these tables by the exit full of boxes, hoping you'd see it and buy on impulse. So I looked and it said, the stress buster. And I thought, now that's interesting. I wonder what the stress buster is. So I picked up the box and turned it over. And when I turned it over, there was a punching bag. And it had two eyes and a nose and a mouth drawn on it. And I surmised, because I'm an intelligent person, <laughs> that their idea of dealing with your discomfort is to hang that punching bag up, probably not in the living room, maybe in the garage or the basement, and then look at it and assume that whoever's face is on there is the person causing you your stress and then just wallop the living daylights out of it. <laughs> I thought about buying it, but I didn't. <laughs> but I remembered as I walked out that God had a stress-busting program in the Bible. It goes like this. Be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds by Christ Jesus. If you want some comfort tonight, why don't you bow before Calvary and say, Lord, you loved me. I'm going to love you back. And I'm going to find my comfort in that great love wherewith you loved us.
<laughs> what a message, hey amen. I, I've encouraged, been encouraged by that message. Uh, what are you scraping with? I'm telling you what, we need God during this time, don't we? And uh, boy, thank God for Brother Brian's message, and I'm thankful for the Word of God. So don't forget now to like, comment, and share this message. Boy, there's some people I know need to hear this message, so make sure you get it out. All right, well, good to see you again tonight, and Lord willing, we'll see you back on Wednesday night. Be praying, and we'll see you then. For more information, please visit our website at cbcsilercity.com.